Now with Limerick aiming to win a fourth All-Ireland title in five years this weekend against Kilkenny, it's worth noting the journey Limerick hurling has been on over the course of the last decade or so to get to this seeming point of dominance. It's just over a decade since the county was involved in a civil war at senior level that saw them ultimately relegated from Division 1. Jerome O'Connell has been covering the team for the Limerick leader during all that time and Mike Galligan is a veteran of their talented 90 squad and an architect of the academy system that has borne such incredible fruit over the last few years. Gentlemen, you're very welcome to the show and thank you for taking time out from uh, preparations this week, which I'm sure are hectic, uh, down below ahead of the game in Crow Park. Um, Mike, I'll, I'll turn to you first. Um, it has been quite the incredible journey for Limerick Hurling, particularly when we look back in those days in the late noughts, early tens uh, of this uh, century, whereby the county at senior level seemed to be tearing itself apart and there seemed to have been a concerted effort born from that to get its house in order, for the county to get its house in order. Yeah, I suppose what happened back back then was unfortunate. Um, I think we weren't the only county, county to suffer problems like that. But, you know, um, I suppose everyone got together and, and for the common purpose, everyone rode in together and, and I suppose with, with the, the development squads, um, you're bearing the, bearing the fruit of that now. Um, Jerome, looking back on those days uh, under Justin McCarthy, how toxic had things gotten down in Limerick by that stage? Yeah, sometimes you just have to, I suppose, hit rock bottom before you, you know, acknowledge that things need to change. And uh, we can all still think back to, uh, it's not that far ago, that long ago, that we can think back to that 2009 All-Ireland semi-final as Tipperary just reigned in the goals in, in, in Crow Park and, you know, leaving leaving Crow Park that evening. And I think that's probably, uh, John Kiley has referenced it a couple of times, that he made a phone call from the, steps of the Hogan stand to uh to people that you know change had to had to happen and you know here we are a number of years later and, and John is very central to the whole thing but certainly leaving that day you know Limerick Hurling was at a low ebb and what followed the that autumn and that winter and into the following spring you know di- difficult difficult times um to see a team you know on the field which you know, just really wasn't very competitive. You know, in, in fairness to them, they, they trained hard and they worked hard. But I mean, you're you're missing an awful lot of your top top players. But off the field and in the background, that was a catalyst for for people to you know get their heads together and and realise that things had to change and had to change from from the bottom up. And hence, you know, we had lifting the treaty as it was called. And I suppose the you know the, the modern day Limerick uh, underage hurling academy that there it had been. You know, a couple of development squads throughout various years. Um, I can think of one under brother Philip Ryan, which probably was a catalyst for Limerick winning the three under 21 titles, uh, 2000 to 2002. But there was nothing ever on a continuous basis. But certainly after 2009, 2010, um, the, the hurling academy as we know it now was was born and uh, bit by bit started to bear fruit. Mike, it's quite one thing for a talented bunch of players to be turned around, say, by a coaching staff. It's quite another to try and change the entire culture of a county and try and get everybody rowing in the same direction when things did seem so chaotic for a time down there. Where did you come involved along this journey? I suppose initially, Shane Fitzgibbon would be the... It would have been his his brainchild, really, and and his whole concept that we needed to do something. Um... Shane, along with Avery D, who, who's still involved with the seniors now, would have come up with the whole lifting the treaty idea, um, the plan. Um, Shane asked me to get involved uh, along with others like Frankie Carroll, Joe Cunningham from UL, George Lee, hur- hurling people. Eamon Cregan was involved. Uh, Ger Hagerty was involved. Brian Finn, hurling people who had Limerick hurling at heart, who wanted to see Limerick hurling improve. Um, I suppose the whole concept really was to develop like the minor minor teams hadn't been performing too well so the whole idea was to develop underage players through the development squads uh, through extensive trialling and, and trying to look at every every young fella in the county at under 14 level and, and bring bring them through trying to develop into into them what was required to, to become an inter-county hurler you know as regards their diet strength conditioning rest um, psychology, like strength and conditioning with Andy, Andy Murphy, um, the, you know, and you were never going to win. Like it wasn't about winning under 14, under 15, under 16 tournaments or even winning minors. It was developing players that you would develop 
players through each squad and each age group and, and you would bear fruition of that down the road with, with um, under 20s and uh, 21s as they were at the time and ultimately the senior team. Did it take much convincing to bring the likes of yourself and Jerry Cunningham and Eamon Cregan back on boards to, to get involved in this or was it like all hands to the pump we actually see what the vision is here? Did the vision need to be sold to you to a degree or was it just no actually this makes sense we should all be on board for this? Well look we all had a massive interest in Nimmick Harling. We were all former players. Um, when Shane put the put put the um the plan to me and, you know, I can still remember being inside in the the old Ardu Ryan Hotel and, and lifting the treaty this concept and the, the blueprint was, was drawn up and the county board were there and you know, we believed in, in what we were doing. We believed it was the way forward. Um you had good people involved. Um it took a while I suppose for, for people to buy into it, county board and, you know, it, 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 a lot of the changes were, were fairly radical, you know, and to do that, we had to have the right people involved to, to promote that. Jerome, you, are, you would have been covering county board meetings. How difficult it was a sell was this to the county board? Because in some instances, like I can think back to, you know, different kind of proposals that have been brought to county board meetings as regards improving the well-being of a, of a county team. Sometimes they're well received, sometimes they aren't. How was this received at the time? Yeah, there, there was acceptance of, of change being needed, but I can remember back and was one of the sticking points or one of the, the areas of contention would have been that at the time, all of the Limerick Board and Oak activities were run on a divisional basis, um, city, west, south and east. And, and part of the plan was to, to get rid of those four divisional structures, get rid of the four divisional boards and, and all the officers and, and to run things on, on a county-wide basis and remember at the time that you know that was a, a pretty monumental change for a lot of people um you know i suppose a, a number of the aspects that would have been looked at at the time were you know the travel concerns for people that would now be asked maybe to, to travel longer distances for for games from from under 12s upwards um but, but there was the acceptance that change was needed but but certainly there was a, a couple of sticking points and you know when, when you're changing anything in in life there there will be reluctance and and there was but at the same time uh when the debate was done um you know i, I think the the vote for change was was pretty um pretty emphatic mike it does take an awful lot of manpower as you mentioned there you just rattle through the names of the people who were brought on board initially but it obviously takes a lot of time and commitment from yourselves to put into this and initially when Shane Fitzgibbon put this plan forward and when it was put in place after the county board okayed it, like what was being asked of you week on week in terms of st- uh, time and, and effort that you were given towards these younger teams? I'd like to give up my game of golf anyway for a start. <laughs> um, no, look, it, it was easy to be involved. You know, we we had a great bunch of people involved. I named them, you know, the likes of Frankie Carriger, Cunningham, George Lee. Great people. We had great times. You know, it was enjoyable. You didn't feel like work. You were getting great feedback from the players. It was a fantastic panel of players. The first panel we put through, you had the likes of Shane Dowling, um, you had um, uh, David Reedy, you, you had Dan Morrissey. You know, so you you could see the players being nurtured. You could see them developing as as they went through from 14s, 15s, 16s. Um, so look, it, it wasn't it wasn't a job. It wasn't a chore. It was it was in, they were enjoyable years, and and we had great fun doing it. So I mean, I, I'm sure all the following the, the squads that followed our our age group up along, you know, the likes of Joe Quay took on the two years behind us. They all had great fun. It was it was it was a great time to be involved with Limerick There was a great buzz there about the development squads, and and everyone could see what was being done and why it was being done. So everyone bought into it. Yeah, these things though, Jerome, they often take um, they often take a, a lot of will, obviously, from the the characters involved, but also for such structures to be put in place, you do need a bit of help financially along the way. Luckily, there was uh, somebody with pretty deep pockets uh, in the county that managed to come on board and managed to see the vision that was being put forward here. Um, JP McManus has been central and crucial to this whole thing for the past decade, really, hasn't he? Yeah, um, yeah. JP McManus will 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 always get the plaudits, but um, I I think if you if you look deeper into it in terms of the actual underage academy, um, it is much uh, unheralded brother Jerry McManus that's actually been key to the to the underage academy. JP has more so tended to to focus on the the adult teams, uh, the senior hurlers and footballers, but 
at, at underage, Jerry McManus has been a a, a huge uh, help to to the academy for for a long number of years. JP is certainly um, there in the background as well, but but Jerry has probably been the more prominent uh, of the brothers in terms of the underage academy. And you know there was a, a, a leap of faith needed there to to get involved. But when you see the caliber of person and ex hurlers listed out by by Mike there in the last couple of minutes, it just shows. Um, you know, the, the talent that, that was being put into these groups and with the likes of Avro D, Liam Hayes, Joe, Joe McKenna and, and others in the background in terms of the logistics and, and the planning and all of that. But the, from day one, you know, there there was no stone left unturned on and off the field, you know, top quality coaches, top quality coaches being coached as well, which, which was central to it. You, Jerry Wallace was brought in and, and in after Jerry Anthony Daly was brought in both as the early days head of the academy coaching and you know that that in itself was almost a, a signal of intent that you know we're, we're going out outside the county here we're bringing in guys that have achieved at, at the highest level and uh, I think that that was that was a big thing you know it gave a bit of status to the academy that Limerick had these you know two guys in there um, coaching the coaches involved with the teams from 14s all the way up to minors and uh, it, it just I think sent out the message that, that Limerick's Underage Academy are, is doing things right. And, and for that reason, it was easy to attract in the kids, easy to attract in the coaches. And this is at a time when, you know, we, we weren't yet winning. Um, absolutely no doubt about it, that it's a, a very easy task in, 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 in the current climate. But if you go back 10, 12 years, you know, you, you were asking people to take a leap of faith. But uh, as Mike said, you know, a lot of the right people did that and, and put their shoulder to the wheel for a few years. Mike, how important was that kind of outside perspective from the likes of Anthony Daly towards the academy setup? And a lot of that would have happened now after we, we had finished with the development squad, but it was huge. I mean, the experience Anthony Daly and Jerry Wallace would have brought in, you know, they were they were working on a full time basis. So, you know, their their knowledge and, and their understanding as as Jerome said of coaching coaches, you know, was, was very important to to bring what we call now to develop the, the the academy to a different level, if you like, you know that it is, is it is it grown out from the development squads up into what what it is now the academy. How important are those kind of development squads? Because <clears throat> even looking through other sports, there we're doing a piece tonight on on the IABA and the governance structures that are being uh, you know uh, imposed upon them at the moment. And one of those is is talking about those development squads and and building a culture and building you know development areas for players to thrive in and to thrive in the right circumstances. How important were they for that group of players coming through at that stage? Absolutely, they were. Because, I mean, you, 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 had, to, you, you had to train these players both psychologically and, and, and physically. In, into, I mean, for instance, you know, a lot of people talk about the, the physique of the, the Limerick team at the moment. Like, Andy Murphy would have had those young players at 14 or 15 lifting empty, empty bars with no weights on them, just working solely on technique. You know, and as their bodies developed... At 15, 16, the way it started coming on, and 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 that's how you know they they've developed as their bodies developed, and that's the, that's why they are the, the, the specimens that they are now, and the athletes they are are, are now. Um, you know, even diet, rest, how to conduct yourself as an intercounty hurler. You know, even even you know getting training gear for them, treating them well, treating them like you're an intercounty player now. Just that feel good factor. You know, the, the, the players bought into that. The players. Acknowledge the work that was being done, and they, they were they were delighted to be part of it, and and they reciprocated with 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 their enthusiasm and and their dedication. Yeah, we've we've often made a lot of um, the mental aspect of what's gone into the Limerick senior team, and you think so, think of like Paul Kinnerick and stuff in the last few years. But going into the academy level, the the name of Anya McNamara is doing some research on this one, kept propping up Jerome. Yeah. She seems like an incredibly important person. Michael, I'll get your opinion on her in a moment. But Jerome bringing in that kind of outside expertise and something that wouldn't necessarily been associated with youth teams and youth structures seems to have played a, a, an incredibly pivotal part in the development of these players. Yeah, Anya was involved at the at the very, very outset of it and in putting the plan in place. And I think that's why... When you, when you look at how Mike is detailing every step of the of the journey for the player there, that you know it, it wasn't just about molding a hurler. It, it was it, it has always been about trying to mold a hurler to, for the future. You know, uh, wasn't about you know you must get results at fourteen or you must get results at fifteen. You have to be winning silverware. It, it was about ensuring that the, the hurler was developed 
physically and mentally and you know that they were uh, I suppose educated to to live the life that would be necessary um, to, to be a senior hurler and that, that was always the aim to be a fully rounded senior hurler uh, I think uh, mentally and physically they were prepared uh, keeping fun central to it was was also a big thing and uh, you know they, they, they've done their homework and I suppose they, they continue to do their homework I, I, I know that there was a delegation from from Limerick in in, in recent months um were, were guests of the the Welsh FA um just to, again to, to look at structures and to see how they can continue continue to improve uh, fellow Munster man I think in there Noel Mooney would have been pretty central to that but yeah Mike give us an impression of, of the likes of Anya McNamara and the influence that she had upon the setups there yeah I mean I can remember um doing a workshop uh, an all day long well after the workshop out in the UL Activity Centre in, in Killaloo and you know it was it was a fun thing but at the same time it was a workshop it was a psychology on you put the, group, the, the players into groups um, she got them using their heads using their brains getting them to think doing workshops the way they can do it you know and we did activities and it, it was a fun day but it was a work day at the same time it helped with team bonding but it also put the onus on the players you know to to think for themselves outside the box and and this is the way forward. I mean, it, it was it was incredible to see the, the the young players develop from 14 to 15 to to 18 years. You know, to to, to the end they are now. To think back in your own days as a player, did engaging in something like that, and um, particularly you know your stage in life and, and engaging in coaching, did that feel quite alien to you, or did it feel quite alien to any of the players? You think? No, no. I mean, it was it was accepted. It was it was new to the players. It was kind of new to us as well. I suppose. I mean, it was. Shandis that would have brought on you in, and um, it, it was it was different. It was a different outlook, a different way of, of having a training session. It wasn't the same old, you know, going out doing the same thing. It was it was different, and the, and the players really bought into it, and you could see the benefits of it, and you, you still you still can. Uh, Jerome, like when you're talking about uh, the the at the intercounty, sorry, at the county board level, that there being you know not necessarily resistance, but at least a couple of questions when this road started. There seems to be generally since then quite an open-minded outlook towards all of this that and and when you know success isn't an initial thing success isn't immediate like you do have to wait up until four or five years ago to get one, that first All-Ireland over the line but there did seem to be an incredible amount of faith and an incredible amount of open-mindedness involved in this entire process yeah there was and while success in terms of Lee McCarthy Cup level was was 2018 if you think back to 2013 uh, Limerick won a Munster minor title and I suppose that was the first real confirmation that you know the, the academy system was, was was the way to go forward that was Limerick's first Munster minor title since uh, 1984 uh, so that, that that had bridged quite a gap for the county um, retained that Munster minor title the following year in 2014 and um, I think I think on on, uh, on Sunday you know 10 of that group um, will will be part of the Limerick hurling panel, so that's that's a huge uh, bedrock of players that are still involved and, and came from that one panel in 2014, which um, ironically enough went on to lose the All Ireland final, the All Ireland minor final to Kilkenny. Mm. But that you know that immediate um, success at minor level just I suppose was the injection that everybody needed to to to, to show them that this is the way forward. It, it may have taken another four or five years. For the success at senior level but you know in, in those years what you had was Limerick minor teams that were reaching I think they reached eight out of nine Munster minor finals winning four of them so that was you know eight nine seasons where Limerick minor teams be it 17 or 18 were hurling you know well into the months of July and August and uh, getting huge continuing development whereas if you go back maybe five or six years your Limerick minor team were you know maybe winning one game maybe two in a season and you know, gone early doors and missing maybe another two or three months of development like they have for the last eight or nine years. Yeah, Mike, that breakthrough at minor level, how much did that give you a signifier that things were definitely heading on the right track? Absolutely. I mean, like prior prior to the, the, the um, development squads taking over, the minors hadn't been performing too well, the results hadn't been great. So uh, first year we got involved, we, we beat Cork and we, we lost Darley an extra time to Waterford at minor level and following a year... Uh, again, won the first round against Cork in Cork and lost to Clare after extra time. So you you were getting that bit of bit of, I suppose, performance from 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 the players, and then 
you know, it, it went to a different level then when, when I suppose they got they got the breaks and, and and the players start to get into most of the finals and then you start to winning them and, and I suppose when, when as Jerome said, when you get a bit of success like that it, it kind of follows on and it's it's easier to be involved and, and all of a sudden you have a conveyor belt of, of talent coming through and, and you're you're bearing the fruits of that now and, and definitely those those minor squads were, were, were massive for the development of, of the academy to, to bring it to the next level. Mike, when you when you think about those, you know, first couple of uh, minor successes, and you consider that obviously you're one of the people who are in on the ground floor, and you've seen the amount of work and the amount of people that has been involved in getting to this rather narrow point of intercounty success, is it galling when you hear whispers from the outside that this has all been down to McManus money? Yeah, but I mean, Jerry, um, Jerome alluded to it there. It's like Jerry McManus has 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 been the, the main man as regards looking after the the, the, the academy. Um, the work was being done, and the work had been very positive, and and had been making great progress. But at the time, obviously, as it got bigger and it, and it, it grew mo- momentum, you you needed financial backing. Um, you know, ultimately, you can't buy in All Ireland. We can't buy transfer players and for for big fees. You know, these are all limerick players who have been developed through the system through the development squads they're limerick men and, and they're winning all Ireland for limerick now yeah Ed, that kind of system though ends up being the envy of a lot of people Jerome now and, and a lot of people a lot of counties could serve to, to replicate the manpower that has been put into setting up an academy set up and setting up a conveyor belt are the uh, not necessarily the conveyor belt I think the, in the Fitzgibbon Shane Fitzgibbon piece that I read a few years ago it was about building the rocket uh, not necessarily manning the rocket, not necessarily heading to the moon yourself, but building it, putting it together, making sure the pieces are in place for others to succeed down the line. Yeah, and I, I suppose in tandem to all that, um, you know, it, it's not a kind of a standalone solution to the problem, but we've, we've also had the, the success of our school reach, um, you know, Limerick CBS, Sexton Street in Limerick was the, the Limerick Hurling Nursery for years, and you know, I suppose population changes and different things meant that you know they weren't at the top table of, of post primary schools hurling anymore. And and our school reached almost in tandem, you know, to, to the underage academy setting up in in two thousand nine and ten, they started to win Dean Ryan's Hearty Cups contest Crow Cup finals against um St. Kieran's of, of, of Kilkenny. Um, and and they're still there. You also then had the, the maybe the rise of prominence of of Napierschik, you know, regularly winning Munster club titles, uh, winning an All Ireland club title. So wh- while the academy was, you know, and, and rightly gets much acclaim, you know, th- there was a couple of, uh, of of other rockets in, in in the sky as well that that helped Limerick at that time. But you know whether it's an academy system or a development squad or whatever you want to call it, um, there has to be something to, to nurture the talent up along and, and direct it in the right way. And, and it has to be something that's, this was aligned. You can't have a, a 14s group and a 15s group heading off and doing something different um, and having chaos when, when you get to maybe a minor level. I think that's the, the, the continuity that, that's central to the whole Limerick thing, the 14s, 15s, 16s, minors. You know, on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning, whatever it is, on a particular weekend, they will train, bang, 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 one after another, one after another, and and again, you know, to be able to use the facilities of the University of Limerick as well was was a, a, a huge um, facility for the group, and I suppose it, it gave it that little bit of, um, I, I suppose, a little bit of class to it as well. That if you're bringing a 14 year old out to the facilities in, in UL, you know, he thinks, wow, this is, you know. I, I, I've made the big time here. Look at these facilities; they're they're top of the range, and you know Limerick are very fortunate to have that to to use as well when, when they were starting out. Mm. Mike, this has obviously got to be a living, breathing thing. You can't just set in place these uh, rigid structures ten years ago and, and expect them to be the exact same, and expect them, you know the players involved to be the exact same as they were ten years ago. How have things changed over the course of this past decade with how those structures are run? Look, I, I can't speak firsthand. I'm not involved uh, as, at, at the moment, but mm. it, it, it has it has involved. It had to evolve. You know, if if you if you stand still, you, you stagnate. You know, and you, I'm, I'm sure that it has got a lot more professional, and and the, the people involved are more professional. And 
you know, it, it, it will constantly evolve. There will constantly be, be, be kids coming in into the squads and it will change over a period for the better. But the whole thing is is, is to keep it going. That's, that's the, the fundamental importance of the, 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 the squads is, is to keep them going. Jerome, from the outside looking in, should people be fearful of Limerick winning 8 out of 10, 15 out of 17 All-Irelands over the coming years with the, the setups that are in place down there? I think right now we'd, we'd take one on, on, <laughs> on Sunday afternoon if you if you were handing them out like that. But look, they're continuing to do the right thing. And I suppose if there's a change at the academy system, it's that we don't need to bring in an Anthony Daly or a Jerry Wallace anymore. Um, Pat Donnelly, you know, an all Ireland under-21 winning manager, is now there. Um, Paul Brown is is more or less filling the... Uh, the, the head coach role and you know he, he's a 2018 All Ireland winner so we we now have our, our own quality coaches we own we now have our own expertise that we've developed over the last number of years and I suppose that's one of the key changes that that Anthony Daly and Jerry Wallace role has now become an internal role and I suppose that that's a great sign of the, of the progress of our own coaches and, and the success we've had at you know minor 21 uh, and, and senior level but. In terms of taking the eye off the ball, you know, I think people are very aware that you simply can't do that. You know, when your senior team is going as well as Limerick's, if you neglect, you know, um, your 14s and your 15s, well, look, that that's the rock you will perish on because, you know, we, we have an incredible group of, of players, um, a, a core group of 20 players are, are you know, bidding to win their fourth dollar in the middle on, on Sunday. But that core group of 20, you know, as I mentioned earlier, so many of them came from the 13 and 14 minor group that you have to ensure that there's fresh blood and, and fresh competition um, coming into the squad on, a, on a, an annual basis. And then credit to John Kiley and Paul Kinnerkin and the guys involved. They've done that. Um, you know, we're, we're going for three in a row on Sunday, but there's seven guys in the group that are looking to win their first medal. So they are continuing to inject fresh blood. And I think that's that's very, very important. And uh you know, the day you stop competing at minor level, that, that's when you know that, that something has gone wrong in your uh, academy system and you need to, to re- go back and reboot. Mm. Lessons to be learned, I think, for a lot of people, and it's the envy of many counties, I have to say, the, the systems that are in place down in Limerick. But for now, uh, Jerome O'Connell from the Limerick Leader and also uh, Mike Galligan as well. Thank you so much for stopping by and talking to us this evening. Have a great